This isn't the image you'd normally associate with Soweto. The white man is Tony Stratum, an Afrikaner. His parents, his grandparents, in the parlance of the black liberation movement were the oppressors, those who created and enforced the apartheid system. South Africa has been a non-racial democracy for 15 years now. Stratum is just another construction worker, but it's no ordinary job. He's here building a museum, the Nelson Mandela Museum. So you're working on the Mandela Museum? That's right, yeah. How do you feel about that? Yeah, good. How would your grandfather have felt about that? I don't know. <laughs> Soweto is noticeably peaceful these days, surprisingly normal. It even bears that badge of middle-class suburbia, the shopping mall. The only hint that it is where it is, this sculpture of an iconic moment during the freedom struggle. It's hard to believe this is Soweto. At the height of apartheid, there wasn't even electricity here. There were no paved roads and there were certainly no shopping malls. This mall is full of upmarket stores and of course, there's a McDonald's. It was built by Richard Maponia, a black entrepreneur from Soweto. He defied the odds to become one of the wealthiest people in the country. When it opened two years ago, it made a powerful statement about how far this country had come and where it was going. You won't find many white people at the Maponia Mall because Soweto remains predominantly black. Visit the trendy Rosebank Mall not too far away and there is plenty of evidence that the so-called Rainbow Nation is comfortable with itself. Again, go back to the Rosebank Mall 20 years ago and it would have been virtually all white people. You can see around here, I like all rainbow colors is here, man, black and white. So we are living, I think, freely and happily after that. We're from the new generation. Honestly, I was born after apartheid. It doesn't affect us. You know, everyone mingles, which is great. If you look closely at the scene, there are cases where black and white directly interact or sit at the same table. But the general trend, particularly among the older generations, is a group of white people at one table, black people at the other table together yet separate. It's time, it's time. These professional black, professional white South Africans in their 40s grew up in a country very different to the one that they live in today. They haven't had the time and the opportunity to develop those relationships in the social setting. But South Africa's school system is having an enormous impact shaping the new generation, deracializing the most racialized country on the planet. These students at Greenside High in Johannesburg started school just after Nelson Mandela was elected. Their attitudes are strikingly different from previous generations. We also did a, a, an exercise in drama where, the, where we were segregated, like the, back, the black kids um, went to one side and the white kids went to one side. And it really, it wasn't nice. It just felt so painful. Like, how did the people in those days live, you know, with themselves? and things like that, it was, I'm just glad it's over. So it's not easy for these students to walk out of school and face the reality of lingering racism on the streets. They talk of feeling uncomfortable in certain neighborhoods. David Skinner talks about standing up to his grandfather. He isn't exactly used to the fact yet that um, we're actually all multiracial now. It has taken time, but things have changed. The Parkview Golf Course was whites only at one time. There are more black members than ever before now. In the beautiful winelands around the Cape, a black winemaker is blending this year's vintage. South Africa's wine industry remains almost exclusively white. Itsiki Biela is the first black woman to work in it. And consider this, she didn't even know what wine was when she was growing up. Now she's an expert hired to create the wines of Stella Kaya. It is a long way from the entirely black Zulu area of rural Natal. You look around, you find you're the only black person there. It's not, an, it's not a nice feeling, but you try and mingle with the people and talk to people. Clearly, it wasn't easy for Insiki, but she is now firmly part of the upwardly mobile black middle class. She escaped poverty, but Insiki is one of the lucky few. Wealth is no longer defined by skin color in this country, but the truth is that the vast majority of the poorest of the poor are still black. 
and the gap between the haves and the have-nots in South Africa is as wide today as it was during the apartheid years. Travel to the squatter camps, the shack settlements around the country, and you hear the frustration. You see, we're still living at the same time like we were living the past years. You see, according, you can see the houses, how the houses are looking. Whites make up less than 10% of the overall population, but the majority of white people are far richer than the majority of black people in South Africa. It is a recipe for resentment. Faith lives in a small wooden shack with her two children. She used to work cleaning in Cape Town's hotels. She says her employers were always white. And when you were working for them, did you feel equal? No. Why? Because they've got everything that I don't have. People here are equal on paper, but because of their economic circumstances, many, many black South Africans in places like this do not feel equal. They are still, they say, second-class citizens. And that will be the challenge facing South Africa's future rainbow generations. For World Focus, I'm Martin Seemungle in Cape Town, South Africa.